Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Drupal.org update panel, where we talk about collaboration, community, and infrastructure that's all enabled by the work of the Drupal Association. I want to invite you, not require you, but invite you to move on in if you like. We're in the big ballroom, but it's usually a relatively small, intimate panel. So if you'd like to move closer, you can. But we're all introverts here, so you don't have to. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for coming. We're going to be talking about the engineering initiatives of the Drupal Association, uh, all the various kinds of things we're working on, whether those are things kind of on the, the back end of the infrastructure that supports Drupal.org, or things that go into supporting major initiatives like the Starshot initiative announced by Dries. So we're going to talk a lot about these different things. Um, and um, you know, the, the fundamental goal, besides keeping the lights on, making it possible to download Drupal, making it possible to get angry with each other in the issue queues, and all those other things, is to really accelerate contribution in the Drupal community. Um, and that's what we're really here to do. Um, so um, we're going to do some introductions. These are some faces related to uh, Drupal.org that you will see around in various uh, places and up here on stage. Um, we'll do some brief introductions. Um, and hand the mics around for those intros. So I am Tim Lennon, Hestinet on Drupal.org, Chief Technology Officer of the Drupal Association and leading the engineering team. Neil Drum, uh, let's see, yeah, generalist, uh, yeah, do a lot of like site building, like the whole stack development. Brendan Blaine, uh, B-man on Drupal.org, do a lot of development also. <laughs> Alex Moreno, I will say Chief Innovation Officer, <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Pittsburgh, some call me. Cool. Frank Garcia Linares, I work for the engineering team as well, i like, um, web developer, but I've also been heavily involved with the GitLab CI and GitLab initiative. And my name's Narayan Newton, I work for Tagline Consulting and am the infrastructure partner assigned as the systems engineer to build and maintain the backend systems for Drupal.org. Indeed, indeed. And also on the slide is Michael Hess, who many of you met if you attended the security team panel, which was just in this room. Yes, let's everybody point and stare at Michael. <laughs> Hi, Michael, um, who's also a great help to us uh, on the Drupal Association side with um, all sorts of things that we need to get done. So we'll dive into some of our topics. There will be time for Q&A at the end as well, of course, and you'll see us throughout the event, especially in the contribution spaces, if you have questions about Drupal.org or some of our initiatives or ideas and thoughts. And I'll shout out maybe a, at least one or two other people in the audience as we go. Um, I do want to shout out to some infrastructure partners. So Narayan here, of course, is from Tag1 um, and has been instrumental in sort of supporting the modernization of the Drupal.org infrastructure, let's say, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, the Oregon State University Open Source Lab, which is a couple hours south of us, um, has been a fundamental part of the Drupal infrastructure going back to when it moved out of Dries's dorm room. Um, and so uh, the original donated hardware got put in this student-run data center um, that uh, includes a lot of other uh, long-term kind of mature software projects. Apache had some racks in there, KDE, I think, a number of others. Um, Mozilla. Uh, Mozilla, yeah, a lot of folks. Um, so we were in good company down in the uh, server room over there. Um, so we still have a sort of mixed infrastructure where we have some owned hardware uh, at the uh, open source lab as well as migrated into the cloud. And we'll talk a little about that some more at the end. Um, I do want to talk about what the DA invests in engineering. So um, a lot of folks don't necessarily, I think most of you in the room are familiar with the Drupal Association engineering team, but maybe some of you aren't, and maybe some watching the recording after are not. Um, but you know, the Drupal Association's general mission is to like promote, secure, um, protect, enable collaboration, all of these things for the Drupal project. And a, a large portion of the, the whole budget of the association, which is just a staff of about 15 people, is invested on the engineering side of the house to support all of the tools and the resources that go into Drupal. So that means almost half a million in direct cost, more than half a million in in-kind trade with various uh, service providers and vendors and things like that, not counting the salaries for the personnel. And effectively, right now, about half of the net revenue of the Drupal Association winds up directly invested in the engineering initiatives, not counting putting on DrupalCon, not counting contribution sprints, not counting local association interactions or anything else like that. 
these all go into tools that are directly designed to empower you and help to move the project forward. We will touch on this very briefly, the Drupal 7 end of life, and I will direct all questions to Michael Hess here in the front. <laughs> or maybe to XJM, who can answer some of them as well uh, as a core release manager. Um, but um, you may remember in 2022 this PSA that came out um, that was extending the uh, Drupal 7 end of life to November 2023, womp womp. Um, but the true end of life is now fully established as January 5th, 2025. Um, so that date is not being extended, despite any jokes that you may have heard during the security team panel. And if you want to find more information about that, drupal.org slash d7eol. Um, some of the resources there, DIY resources, if you have internal IT teams working on your upgrades, also partners who can help you, whether you're enterprise, mid-scale, freelance scale, anything like that. So a lot of folks who can help you out there. So just a PSA for anyone in the room still working on their migration, which, by the way, includes the Drupal Association staff. <laughs> We're still working on it. Um, so let's talk about Drupal.org as project infrastructure. Oh, I get the quote here. OK. Uh, so yeah, a lot of what I've been working on, or one of the things I've been working on is uh, package signing, which supports automatic updates in Project Browser. So uh, we want uh, package, sign pa package signing so what your site is automatically updating to is verifiable as coming from Drupal.org. Uh, so uh, we sponsored uh, development of something called Rugged, uh, which uh, implements the update framework for uh, for automating the signing process. Uh, and then uh, for core, that's hosted, uh, it, when you download Drupal core and the core components, those come from uh, GitHub. Uh, and uh, we can't sign anything up from, from GitHub uh, because it they don't provide any guarantee that the files will stay the same. Um, and so we'll, we're running a mirror of that, uh, a composer mirror of that called, uh, with a pr project called Satis, and then integrating the uh, Drupal.org packaging and infrastructure. Uh, so right now, uh, staging is in testing. Uh, the client side folks are uh, seeing how, how that works, and we've had a few rounds of back and forth finding issues, fixing them, and uh, we're working to make that production ready in the next few weeks. Something like that. And I don't know if Ted Bowman is in the room, but Ted has a session on automatic updates. Actually, maybe it's happening now. I'm not sure what. I think it's tomorrow. OK. So there, there is a session. If, you're under, if you want to understand more about automatic updates from the Drupal client side, Ted will be talking a lot about that. And he'll also very likely be working with Neil here during uh, Contrib Day on validating this uh, staging setup for the whole signing yeah. process. Yeah, and since staging is, is uh, working, they have, uh, you can try out automatic updates on and test it. 3 p.m. tomorrow. 3 p.m. tomorrow. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and upgrading Drupal.org. Uh, so that's already started. Uh, Drupal.org is actually a few different subsites. Uh, the events.drupal.org uh, and api.drupal.org have already been upgraded. Uh, localized, uh, supported by the community, and they are uh, well on their way to getting that towards an upgrade. Uh, and we've started consolidating and removing functionality uh, from the rest of the site to, uh, you know, if there's less to migrate, then the job's easier. Uh, so we used to have a association.drupal.org. We still do have that. Uh, it has some old blog posts that we've you know, old uh, board meeting minutes we probably shouldn't throw away. So those will move into Drupal.org. Uh, the security.drupal.org, uh, uh, that's also running, you know, issues. Uh, and that's going to be merged into Drupal.org and GitLab. Uh, so issues can still be reported. Uh, groups, we're still kind of figuring that out, uh, but most of the functionality is moving into Drupal.org, like events have already moved towards Drupal.org. Uh, the main blocker for the last bits of groups.drupal.org is the multilingual support, which will hopefully come in the Drupal 10 upgrade, and so that there can be 
uh, regional groups still organizing um, and being able to do so in their local languages. Yeah, and then uh, in removing some functionality in favor of uh, GitLab and you know, wherever else we can, like uh, commit listings, um, uh, those, you know, what used to see like number of commits to each project on your user profile, that's that's gone. Issues are of course migrating to GitLab and jobs.drupal.org. Uh, uh, that's a little bit of an open question. It's not a really complex site, but uh, there's also a lot of ways to run a job board. Uh, Drupal 10 sites, do you wanna go ahead and jump in? Yeah, so as uh, Neil said, we already have two Drupal 10 sites um, live, up and running. Obviously, events.drupal.org, all of you have used it to sign up for the conference. Site has been running smoothly for more than a year. It's been now four conferences already running on it, if we include Barcelona. Um, it is importing sessions from two different sources. So I've just, uh, I mean, we use Sessionize here on the US side of things, and then Kuoni have their own system on the European side. Um, yeah, again, it's working smoothly, thanks to B. Um, it was actually the first Drupal 10 site that we made live, and it helped a lot with the infrastructure and all the folder structure, these kind of things, because basically we are replicating what we did there for all the new sites. Um, one of them is uh, api.drupal.org. I needed to update the slide as of yesterday because we made it live this past week. Um, the site was... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the site was uh, paid for a bit, but obviously always competing priorities. Uh, but yeah, now the old site was having more and more issues. Uh, most of them were that the old site was running on an old version of PHP, on an old version of the parsing library. So the new features of PHP weren't even a thing. It's like, I don't know what to do with this. So obviously many pages were not even rendering. All that is sorted now. We have a couple of hiccups performance-wise uh, during the week, but most of them are now um, sorted. Um, we are also working on improving it a bit more, but yeah, uh, we're pretty happy and pretty excited to have the second uh, Drupal 10 site. It's giving, giving us more confidence as well in the infrastructure in all the kind of work that we are putting in. Yeah, yeah, and these are really preparing us to turn it into a repeatable pattern since uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff we did with events that we forgot that uh, you know, now we can make a standard platform for all of the sites. Uh, so uh, www.drupal.org itself. Uh, so when we did the uh, upgrade from six to seven, we actually turned the site off for about 24 hours and um, ran the migration script and then turned it back on. I, I don't think we can get away with that again. Uh, so. Uh, we're doing a rolling migration where uh, both the Drupal 7 and modern uh, versions of the site will be handling requests. Uh, so first up, uh, read-only API traffic will be uh, sent to the modern site uh, for Project Browser. Um, you know, we really want, you know, Project Browser, that's an API we have to support indefinitely uh, because old sites are not going to uh, have uh, API uh, API client updates, so we need to start Project Browser off on the right foot to provide the same JSON structure for ten or twenty years or however long uh, we need to, need to. Uh, and then issue credit and fork management; uh, those are being separated out from issues uh, since issues are moving to GitLab, uh, and that's uh, something you know, we want to build. We want to stop building Drupal 7 uh, functionality, so that's uh, going to be on Drupal 10 uh, from the start. Uh, and we actually have a lot, Fran's done a lot of that work uh, to prepare, uh, but you know, one step at a time to actually launch everything. Uh, the, uh, if you in the previous note, you saw uh, we have a theme and branding refresh coming up. Uh, so uh, landing pages, we want to, you know, building everything for the new style of landing pages. Uh, that'll be on Drupal 10 from the start. Uh, and then for the rest, feature by feature, uh, you know, projects and user profiles, uh, organizations, those would be 
candidates to go earlier than later, since uh, you know we'll have all the all the data for projects uh, with Project Browser, uh, and you know it'll be a matter of you know uh, you know the rest of the year figuring out what's what makes sense to do next. Uh, another big project I've been working on is single sign-on. So that will enable the two, two versions of the site to uh, hopefully mostly be seamless uh, as far as like you locked into one, you locked into both, along with uh, the subsites uh, that do allow login, uh, which is going to be mostly localized uh, after everything settled down. I'd like to add on that front that another Tag1 team member who's in the audience, Marco, uh, has been helping us quite a bit <laughs> with the um, SSO uh, migration process and getting us ready for this. So you will see at a certain point, and we'll, we'll announce this in various social media channels and such, you'll see the login experience change. You'll see it'll look mostly the same, but you'll see a new little interstitial login page. It'll say this is the Drupal single sign-on uh, powered by our Cloud AM vendor, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, if you see a login page, uh, you know, with the Drupal.org domain name, uh, with this logo on it, it it's safe. You can put your password in there, and <laughs> uh, and I believe we'll be uh, we'll be asking everyone to change their password to uh, update it to the uh, Keycloak's password hashes uh, rather than um, supporting Drupal's pa uh, password hashes internally forever. Uh, so yeah, we've done a uh, two production data migrations. You know, it's a mi big migration. Every time we find edge cases, we're finding less and less edge cases, and um, you know, it's something we're going to spend a lot of time on validating the functionality uh, because we need to be able to everyone to be able to log in uh, without any friction. Uh, so that's also something you should expect in the next few weeks. Cool. We'll hand it over to Brendan here. He's going to talk a little bit about some of his work related to marketplace and community connection. And so a lot of the, a lot of the features that involve organizations and communities organizing using Drupal.org tools. Thanks. Green. All right. Uh, wow, I put a lot of words on here, and I can only see like half of them. Um, okay, so uh, recently you may or may not have noticed the marketplace has gotten a pretty big overhaul uh, with the uh, the changes to the Drupal Certified Partner Program. Um, essentially trying to expose a little bit more information that may be useful to people who are looking to connect with partners. Um, trying to, where we can, remove Drupalisms from uh, the marketplace. Uh, expose case studies to give you a little more um, kind of like vi visual interest on the page because it used to be just a giant list of linked numbers, which is less exciting than is is good. Um, yeah, so there have been some questions and confusion about why people are ranked in certain ways, um, mainly because we've got the weighted issue credits listed there, and that's not the whole, uh, the whole story for contribution. So on top of that, we have two programs still running while we have some existing contracts that are going to expire. Um, in the coming weeks, months? I don't know the actual time frame. So yeah, the old partner program and the new Drupal certified partner program have a three month period of overlap where people can choose to renew into the new program or wait out their previous agreement. So there's a little shuffling going on in the marketplace from organizations. If you have questions about that, you can come and let us know. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and p one of the cool things about this is the all organizations view also benefited from uh, this I don't know if I'd call it beautification, but I'm going to call it beautification. Um, so, uh, so that uh, that also now has um, case studies exposed and things like that. So it's just kind of more interesting and gives you a little bit more more info that you might not have had unless you had clicked all the way through to an org page when you're browsing through them. Uh, let's see, owner tools. Yeah, so uh, there have been some changes here, and they they are subtle but a little bit complicated on the backside of things. Uh, the first thing that's different here is we've added event sponsorship credits uh, to, you know, the overall weighting of organizations. Um, so if you get listed as a sponsor on an event on community slash events, uh, you get credits based on a number of things that I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool because, you know, these events don't happen without sponsors. And if you're sponsoring, dang it, you should get credit for it. Um, 
we we do some small changes like handling zero better. That's you know when when I when I'm working on dev and I ha I have some data, I'm always looking at like so the top three, but also I should look at the bottom ones. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully now if you have a, a zero in a category, we're directing you to learn more about how to make it not a zero. Not a zero is good. <laughs> uh, and if you're someone who's never seen this before, this owner tools page, this is for anyone who has an organization listing on drupal.org. So if you are an agency especially, but if you are also a university who's contributing back to Drupal, if you are any kind of other organization that has a profile, this page sort of gives you the aggregate credit information across a variety of categories. So your total weight of credits from all the categories, where that would qualify for you if you're a service provider who wants to be in the marketplace, but also by individual categories to tell you, hey, you're getting some of these because you're posting great case studies, you're getting some of these because you're supporting camps by sponsoring them, et cetera, et cetera. So, because we're trying to create this ladder to create more engagement um, from the people who sponsor this work and who sponsor all of you individually to participate in the hopes that they provide you more time to contribute. Yes, and also, uh, <laughs> funny side effect, we changed how DCP stuff gets weighted and that had a knock-on effect to how the math in this got handled, so that, that was fun. Thank you for bearing with me while I sorted that out. Uh, let's see, ba basically, Drupal.org changes. Uh, I mentioned a couple of these already. Uh, other things that have happened, the Drupal 7 end of life uh, views and partner listings and whatnot, that all got kind of put together quick when, when the confirmation came through that the end is here. <laughs> uh, we added some external events, so you don't, it doesn't have to be a Drupal event on community slash events. If you got a, a cool thing coming up, but it's related to, um, what, what was the one, there was like a... Well, Web Summit, which was a yeah, was general it. technology event, was the first example mm -hmm. of a, it was a, about all web tech, and Drupal was represented for the first time, right? So if you're going to represent Drupal somewhere outside of a Drupal-only event, we yeah. also want to see that there. Yep, uh, and, and then we've kind of talked about events.drupal.org being new and on Drupal 10, and as such, it's still kind of getting run through the paces, and every time we have a new event, we find new fun edge cases, so there's always maintenance to do there. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and ultimately, kind of sh for Drupal.org itself, pushing towards the migration, um, trying to simplify things, uh, it's a big site with a lot of information and a lot of legacy, and the more we can kind of slim it down, the easier it should be. So, um, yeah, doing that when and where I can. Awesome. So over to Alex to talk about the innovation initiatives that started about a year ago. Um, not, all, not solely about engineering projects on Drupal.org, but about the things that enable you folks out in the community and programs we can do to support that. Yep, thanks, Tim. So you're probably all familiar with uh, Pittsburgh. Um, and I, like, I'm not going to go through this slide. I'm going to try to run, actually, because I have a session tomorrow with Irina, and I'm going to talk about all these points, and we're going to have like a whole hour. So if any of this is interesting and you find it that you want to know more, please join our session tomorrow. I think it's uh, two. Pittsburgh, I think we are all familiar with this. Uh, if not, we have a closer session on Wednesday on the Keynotes Initiative. Uh, the highlight to me is uh, we all the projects finished. Uh, they all finished their goals, but actually uh, they are still working on this. So I think that proves the, the value of the money that the investors or the uh, sponsors put in the, the table. It's actually doing a lot more than uh, we, we were expecting outside of the uh, scope of the, of the projects. Uh, green button. To me, this is the highlight of uh, what I've been doing the last few months because uh, before you can even do anything, you need to know what or how this is affecting right, the, the ecosystem, the contribution, and the contribution health dashboards. You may have heard about this as well because I'm very noisy in the social networks in LinkedIn. Um, the idea is to provide that information uh, in a way that whatever changes we are doing as part of the innovation program, we should be able to go back to these uh, numbers and see how, how they are affecting. One nice surprise about all of this is that uh, people are not always positive about how Drupal is evolving, but actually we should look at these numbers. And even before we do anything, it's actually going well. And you have probably seen this graph in uh, this keynote, which makes me very happy. <laughs> 
Um, and in general, uh, yeah, the contribution of the Boards has been very well received. So even though my contract with the Drupal Association is finishing, I'm trying to, I'm going to try to stay involved in this, uh, and hopefully something else in, in the DA. Um, we've been doing as well user onboarding improvements. This is just, in my opinion, the beginning. Um, things like, uh, we need to talk. And, and not like we need to talk, uh oh, <laughs> we need to talk in terms of we have a lot of users coming to our system. We should improve the way that we onboard them, we welcome them, we must try to make them feel, you know, to give them a kind of introduction of how welcoming is, uh, is our community. Uh, come for the code and stay for the community, right? So we, we have to prove them from, from, the, from the beginning because we have a lot of them coming every, every, even every day. And one of the reasons that I think focusing on onboarding is so important, and one of the things that we studied among the various statistics that you generated is that the time from a person first registering on Drupal.org to their first contribution activity of any kind is more than a year, is the typical average. It's a very long time before we, the engagement ladder brings them from just, I, th I created an account because I think I need something on this website to like, I'm even going to leave a comment on an issue <laughs> to, to talk about this, right? So the more we can do to figure out which kind of person they are, like are they a developer, a marketer, who, you know, and then what do they need to know that they can engage with us is really important. And so this, this like you said, was a really important first step to, to just update the welcome message <laughs> with a, com a couple of the very basic things that might get them started on their journey. And there's still a lot to do. For example, I like the, the way Mautic uh, onboards new users in a way that uh, you sign for, for the trial that Drop Solid is, is uh, doing or is collaborating with. And after a week, they send you an email in terms of trying to find if they can help you. And that happens every week after that for a month. Again, it's just showing the user that you are there and you are there to help. Right? So we have a lot to, to learn from that. Is anyone familiar with the Bounty program? Raise your hands. Okay, a few of you. Uh, the Bounty Program started as an experiment, and the idea was, uh, I was having a lot of meetings with uh, partners, with other companies, and they were always asking the, the same questions. It's like, where can I uh, make sure that, or how can, how can I make sure that our contributions are as impactful as possible? So at the moment, uh, there are no uh, clear guidance on that. Um, the Bounty Program started as an experiment to see if we could guide those companies and as well give some something back for them. And our coin or our token is the, the credit system. So we spoke with the uh, course maintainers and we asked uh, for a few issues that would be impactful or innovative for Drupal. And we started the bounty program with that. And the surprise was that it was, well, not necessarily a surprise, but it was very well received. And then the surprise was that uh, issues that were there for five or six years, they started to get out of traction thanks to the program. And actually one of them got fixed in a, a few weeks. I think it was two or three weeks. And it was an issue that was there for five or six years. Right? Um, again, I'm finishing my contract, but I would love to continue uh, this program and see if we could you know, use the learnings here to continue in do, doing good things for, for the Drupal Association, for Drupal, and for, for the partners that are involved in, in open source. Um, Irina and myself, again, we will talk a lot about contribution friction tomorrow. The idea is that uh, the way innovation happens in Drupal is uh, through contribution, so we need to reduce the barriers as much as we can. Um, again, come tomorrow because I think it's very interesting and the research that Irina has been doing is really good. And I think it's that. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. So from here we're going to talk about developer tools, so what you actually are probably putting your hands on uh, every day if you're going to be in the contribution rooms, if you're going to the first time contributor workshop, the things that you use to actually build Drupal. Cool, thank you. So, yeah, I mean, probably some of you only know me just because I've been working on GitLab CI for the, ne for the last six, nine months, so I was um, very happy to be involved uh, on the integration for core. And, and then also we were working on the integration for all contrib modules. The, the goal there was to get a feature parity with Drupal core, and the great news is that we even got many more features that we weren't even expecting at the very beginning. So that will be part of the keynote on Wednesday. I welcome you all to, to go see it because you will see some of the cool features that we've been working on in, in, the, past, um, in the past few months with GitLab CI. 
we also have a full documentation site as well. So as we had more and more options, we realized that we needed to help people and we also needed to help ourselves to kind of keep a check of everything that was available. So hopefully now this site make the onboarding into GitLab CI um, much nicer as well, which is related to what we were talking before. And we should say actually that GitLab CI is the replacement, of course, for Drupal CI, the testing system that we've been using for more than a decade. Um, and Drupal CI is, in fact, deprecated. And Neil, I think you know the dates a little bit better than I do. Uh, June 1st is yeah when the last test will run at Drupal CI. Yeah. Cool. So it is almost done. Now is a really good time to consider, um, during this DrupalCon, finding someone who can help you to onboard into um, GitLab CI. I think you're going to mention that in a second. Um, or finding one of the other project maintainers who's already done it who can probably walk you through the process. And it's actually surprisingly easy. You add an example template file and you're pretty much all ready to go. Um, you, you do not have to write a whole custom YAML to configure your testing. A lot of this has been done for you. So um, hopefully you'll be able to do that this week. Uh, more than 2,700 projects have already done it. Um, so um, we've got a lot of evidence that it's ready to go. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And um, you will see some slides on Wednesday about those dates that thing was mentioning. So you will see one there, one there. Um, and yeah, I will definitely be explaining a lot about uh, how to integrate it. And I will be helping on Contrib Day. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about any GitLab CI integration for Contrib, just yeah, feel free to ping me. We also needed to. I mean, we kind of realized the hard way, uh, and probably um, for those of you who have working modules that are heavily used, you knew this already. In our case, uh, we started kind of working on features, until one day we deployed a feature that broke all contrived. He said, okay, we need to do something about this. So one of the things that we did, we started adopting Sember uh, releases that made our life and contrived people way easier. We now deploy uh, feeling much uh, safer. We have a pool of people that are kind of testing the bleeding edge of the templates. And then if we don't have any issues for a few weeks, then we just update to the latest. Um, and then, yeah, one of the differences at first, uh, GitLab CI code was shared between core and contrib. That was good, but that was not good as well. <laughs> Until, and then, yeah, we kind of um, looked through it. We saw if we could split it, and it was at the end even easier than we anticipated. So, yeah, now Drupal Core is running GitLab CI completely separate from GitLab CI, which allow all of us to evolve in the way that we need. So that was that was a good thing. Um, then, yeah, with uh, a lot of people ask me about GitLab issues. That's that's. I mean. That's a big thing for us. We are, we're all looking forward to have this up and running. But what I always tell people is the competing priorities. There are some dependencies that really need to go first. The first one is single sign-on. We've uh, talked about it um, before. Hopefully, this will be the first one to, to go live. Uh, after that, we need to get contribution records working. So we are re reworking the whole way. As you know, contribution credits were embed in Drupal issues, but if we are talking about migrating Drupal issues, we need to have those credits somewhere else. So we design, redesign the, the system from scratch on Drupal 10. Uh, we need to have that live before GitLab issues. We want to give credit to people that help into projects. And we also need to um, have the functionality for fork management, I, all this. Um, create fork, request access buttons that we now have in, in Drupal.org issues will be available as well in a certain way um, on Drupal 10. And then, yeah, we need to change Drupal 7 itself, Drupal.org, Drupal 7, to accept GitLab issues. Like, up until now, the issues were kind of, we could just make a database query. We can no longer do that. So we need to accept kind of a URL and try to extract information from there. So all those things really need to go first. When they have all the code is written, so basically we need to start kind of deploying things, testing, retesting, then testing again, and then we we'll just deploy. So pieces should fall into place relatively quick. Um, 
After that, we'll probably open opt-in process, so obviously the system is not gonna be perfect, but we will need some projects willing to try it out. So we will, this, we will do something similar as we did with uh, GitLab CI. And um, yeah, once the opt-in process uh, goes well, then it will be a point in which we will migrate all the issues from all the projects uh, hosted currently on Drupal.org. Um, and then, yeah, last but not least, I think this is the last of my slides. As I mentioned before, we've created some very cool documentation for GitLab CI, but we've also written some documentation that is not public yet for GitLab issues, for the opt-in process, for contrib records, fork management, SSO. Uh, the only reason why it's not public is because the systems are not live yet, so it doesn't make any sense to kind of give um, false uh, hope. Um, and yeah, one of the cool things that we did around a month ago is we made all the um, SSO-related um, repositories uh, public. So if you are interested in, in the code that is running behind all the new systems, you can, you can go check it out. Uh, yeah, we also made available the uh, code for the new contribution records uh, system and for the Drupal.org migration itself. So all that code is living in contrib public uh, repositories. If you want to find out, um, yeah, have a look at it. Just feel free to ping me. Um, yeah, handing it over. To you. Awesome, thank you very much, Fran. So Narayan is gonna talk a little bit about the modernization of Drupal.org. I mentioned at the beginning of this, two partners, Tag1 helping us with the infrastructure management and all of these sorts of things, and the OSL where we have owned hardware that's some of which is a decade or more old that we've been managing, um, and it's quite a lot. And so I feel like um, at least 50% of your job is like forensic archeology span um, when it comes to our old servers. But uh, yeah, walk us through it, please. It's helpful that I uh, buried most of the bodies I'm uncovering. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> so what we've been working on is kind of a hybrid cloud migration as we work with new sites like API and events and updated services like the redeployment of the GitLab primary and secondary instances. And everything new we're trying to push into AWS and usually on uh, EKS or Kubernetes clusters there. Um, while we maintain the legacy infrastructure for now, and then at some point we're going to completely exit the legacy infrastructure, rebuild that infrastructure at the OSL and move dev and some aspects of staging and some non-critical paths back to the OSL. Basically trying to find a middle ground between having production and high touch points for the sites on the best supported and most modern hardware while still saving money by having using the pool of hardware that we already have at the OSL. Um, the most impactful part of this of late is probably the GitLab primary and secondary. Um, after a specific GitLab update, we were having some pretty major issues with that, and we lifted and shifted those onto much larger instances in AWS, uh, which has really helped with the rendering time for GitLab and the ability to actually run CI at the scale that we are running CI. Uh, the big things recently, events and API, uh, those are deployed to our EKS clusters, and we are finalizing our maintenance pipelines around them, basically, where we have a much better methodology for updating them, keeping them updated, and rolling out releases to them. Drupal Rugged is deployed there, and project usage processing is now run on these clusters as well. That one was less planned. The uh, server it ran on just stopped working, <laughs> uh, which happens. <laughs> we are migrating while we're doing this from Puppet, an old version of Puppet, to Plumi and Ansible, uh, a lot of Plumi, more Plumi than Ansible. Uh, Plumi, for those that don't know, it's kind of like Terraform or OpenTofu, uh, but it allows you to not use a language designed just for that tool, but write in Python or Go or Node. We use Python. We plan to release some of the core modules that we're writing in Plumi uh, that define reusable parts of this infrastructure that could be generally useful for running Drupal sites on EKS. Uh, an example would be Drupal, unlike a lot of sites that get deployed to Kubernetes, really requires the shared file volume, and we have modules that just 
make that easy and plug and play. So releasing that, I think, would be useful and also allow us to have more people contribute infrastructure components, which generally has been very difficult to do, but this migration um, opens up some possibilities there. So as we do these D10 migrations, basically those sites as they are migrated are going to the new infrastructure. The reason for this is, <laughs> I'm not gonna list the versions we run on the legacy infrastructure. <laughs> um, they are difficult to bring new software into. So we are basically running two infrastructures, the legacy one and the more modern one that we're gonna deploy the new versions to and have the new sites on. At some point, we're gonna hit a line where we're just gonna have to yank the legacy sites over. We are close to that line, <laughs> but uh, we're not quite there. Uh, the new sites require different things. They have different security postures. Uh, the old legacy sites have some security support that is not continuing. Um, just because of how we dealt with issues related to the version issue. Uh, we're migrating site by site. Uh, we're moving to GitOps style deployments. We're actually doing policy enforcement. We're af actually doing network isolation between the sites, which is not something we have done in the past. So the API and the event site can't really hit each other except in planned ways. Um, it's gonna be a pretty large improvement. GitLab CI and GitLab in general is a large portion of what we do now. Uh, we host GitLab more than we host Drupal, probably. Uh, Drupal CI is not maintained anymore. I mean that in every sense. <laughs> um, we don't maintain it. The upstream project that's based on doesn't exist anymore. Does not exist anymore. Can't find it. Um, it's really bad. Uh, CI in general for us is a huge cost leader. So as well as replacing Drupal CI with GitLab CI, which is better in a lot of ways, we're trying to work on reducing the cost of CI. Uh, the DA and core in general cares a lot about CI, way more than many projects I've worked with. And so they spend a lot to make sure those tests run well and right, they want to run fast. And I'll put a number on that. The Drupal Association currently spends between eighteen and twenty-four thousand dollars a month just running CI tests yep. um, to uh, ensure code quality of all the contributions going into Drupal, and that's that's something like you know ten thousand test runs that happen in a single month um, yeah. that results in that. So it's highly efficient. It's incredibly faster than it was before. That's something we celebrated at the last DrupalCon. That core test runs went from like an hour and fifteen minutes to like eight. Um, it's amazing. It's really empowering people. But we do need to look at those expenses because when you do that, you don't get fewer tests and therefore cost savings. You get more tests because they run faster. <laughs> so, yeah. And part of that is that the core tests have to run on very, very large instances just because of how they're built. But historically, every test is the same to the truss. And so the contrib tests and smaller tests are also running on large instances. And by large, I do mean larger than I spin up for any project I've ever worked on, except for Drupal CI. Um, so we are working to integrate something called Carpenter uh, into these clusters and spinning up new GitLab CI clusters that will spin up instances in AWS based on the resource request of the test. So if the test says that it can run on a smaller instance, we spin up a smaller instance and we don't spin up a 60 core instance and then run curl on it which happens. A um, lot. <laughs> so we're gonna have multiple runners on these clusters, we're gonna have multiple clusters. Uh, Kyverno is going here too for policy management. Uh, historically, our CI could be used for other things. Uh, so we're gonna try to make it less used for other things. Um, and then we're working to both not reduce the actual performance that developers see, but also to ensure that the work on the performance testing that's utilizing the CI system, it's called uh, Gander, uh, that compares performance as the CI runs, does not get negatively impacted by us switching these nodes around, which is gonna be interesting, because even a small switch that shouldn't matter, if you're measuring milliseconds in core, it could matter. Um, we think that'll be fine, but it's gonna be a focus for us. And awesome. Uh, so with that, we have about five and a half minutes maybe for Q&A. If there's anyone who has questions, 
about Drupal.org, about contribution enablement, about measuring innovation in the Drupal community, or about um, sophisticated ways to run testing systems or infrastructure, um, we'd love to hear any of those. I think you're up, XGEM. I was gonna wait and hope that someone else went first, just because maybe I'll inspire someone to ask a question. Um, so a question that I had um, was related to the Bug Bug T program and uh, a couple of the points that you had up there on the slide. So as a core maintainer, one of, I forgot to introduce myself, I'm Jess, I'm XJAM on Drupal.org, I'm one of the release managers for Drupal Core. Um, so as a core release manager, um, issues with contribution credit fairness and accidentally creating scenarios that result in a lot of low quality contributions interfering with what we're trying to do as a part of trying to encourage contributions is something I'm always concerned about. Um, I'm wondering, and when I saw like the names of the, of the orgs up there and that about one company had done a majority of the work, I was concerned. I hadn't, I hadn't actually been following what was happening with the button T issues. Um, so did we see um, a lot of sort of like uh, trivial no, or non-helpful Yeah, it's a good question. Issues. So uh, stepping back more broadly or restating the general question, something that folks who are not as tightly tied into the core contribution process as uh, XJAM is, um, right, whenever you have a system like the contribution credit system that creates monetary incentives for contribution activity in the form of position on a marketplace, you are effectively creating an environment that tells people, try and spam contributions and see if you can get them through, right? And that's something that we've been really trying to manage and that's going to be, that's like spam fighting. It's something that's not, it doesn't have a final solution. It, you don't just win. It's an ongoing process to continue following it, continue improving, continue adjusting policies for these sorts of things. On the bounty program specifically though, those four issues, I, we did not have that experience. Those particular ones actually um, were all like responsible, involved folks who were contributing accurate like fixes to those issues. So that was really, really good because, uh, as you say, that feels like it would be an immediate candidate to get a bunch of like spam copied straight out of chat GPT kind of like answers to those sorts or of things. Or people clicking the buttons. Or just people going in and clicking, yes, I'll make a fork, I'll make a fork, I'll make a fork, and or I'll apply a patch and say it's good without testing it or uh, any of those things. So that particular case, it worked, but it is something that we have to keep an eye on. And um, you know, one of the tools that we started adding recently, we've only deployed it once, maybe twice, is we can actually apply negative credit to an organization. So in the case that we have attempted to offer training seminars virtually or w in whatever case, or in the case that we feel like folks aren't listening to our community values or not obeying our terms of service or code of conduct, uh, we also have the option to cause a negative impact on their marketplace rating, creating, again, an economic incentive to make us happier <laughs> with, with their behavior. So we'll see. Um, the next phase of the bounty program, it'll be interesting, because um, I think it'll actually, it may not just be cherry-picked individual issues. It might be components of Starshot. It might be all sorts of things. Did you want to add anything, Alex? I was wondering if, uh, yeah, like we had a lot, of, a lot of discussions in terms of abusing the system. We were gladly dis, uh, surprised in terms of that the companies involved were very respectful and everything was like quite, uh, yeah, it was quite successful. And I wonder if it's because it had a lot of visibility and companies don't want to, you know, have bad visibility in terms, like in general, they want to do the right thing. Yeah, I, I would say that I, mean, I, I also, in my role, uh, have reached out frequently to the individuals involved in contribution, you know, assuming good intentions and they just don't know what the hell they're doing. Um, and also a couple of times b before the DA was able to start supporting it with certified partners, um, reached out to like pe representatives I know at, in like leadership positions or who know people in leadership positions at those companies. And the response is always positive, but that doesn't sort of doesn't it still guarantee doesn't stop behavior. It, it doesn't yeah. fix the tr like there's uh, there's definitely still training needed. I think with a lot of well, one thing I would love to see this progressing is uh, not all issues cause the same to be fixed, right? It's the same as when you are in a company, you have a weight. 
why don't we apply a wave to the issues and then we give credit based on that wave? That's coming kind of the idea of the bounty program. I'm not saying necessarily it's a good idea. Yeah, so committers have been afraid yeah. of that for yeah. the okay. as long as the credit systems existed because we're afraid that it'll shift, it'll get more spam on the criticals. Yeah, but that's an interesting you know, so thought. It I mean it, it, it'll, it'll be a fun, but I, it's a good test case, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I just had one other question on the bounty thing, and I, I know there's a few people behind me, so I'll try to just ask quickly, and then I'm going to go sit down rather than yep. keeping on chatting. Um, you mentioned something about starter issues for new contributions, and I was wondering what that what place that had in the bounty program because I feel like that. Oh, so no, it's not it's not the same thing as the like novice contribution first time contributor workshop. The, the I think that the comment on the slide I may not be remembering was in reference to uh, let's say you have an organization they have decided they would like to become a Drupal certified partner. Um, they. Um, I'm not sure if this is it or not, but uh, but they don't know where to start. And so as a, on an organizational level, they need an introduction to contribution or an introduction to contribution areas. And sometimes what we do for novice onboarding doesn't scale to onboarding an organizational culture. It doesn't on scale to onboarding novices either. But yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> very good. If, if y'all want to reach out to me, like, yeah. I have a whole hell of a lot of experience with that problem yeah, yeah, yeah. space, as do all of the mentoring leads. Yeah. So it might be something that's interesting to yeah, I think, I think that's something we would do together for sure. We are officially out of time. I'm fine to keep answering questions, though, until they kick me out. So <laughs> come on up. Uh, hi, I'm Matthew. Uh, with the GitLab issue uh, migration that you're working on, what is the best place to uh, contribute ideas, opinions? Uh, yeah, so requests, if you want questions. to, yeah, if you want to ask questions or get involved or understand more about the GitLab situation, there is the hashtag GitLab channel in the Drupal Slack. That's probably a good place to get involved if it's related to the CI system. GitLab underscore templates project on Drupal.org and that issue queue is a good place to get involved. Um, and tracking down Fran while you're here um, for some of those issues would probably work well. So um, there's a in, a in a lot of ways, I don't think we're looking necessarily for contributions specifically, but we'll be looking for people to validate that the new, the adjusted workflows we're creating for GitLab in terms of how we migrate metadata into labels in GitLab and some things like that are matching. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'd say that's, that's the place to go. All right, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, Tim. <laughs> um, I'm Jess, not that Jess, different Jess. Um, <laughs> uh, my qu question is, and then I apologize, I was a couple minutes late, so I, I don't know if you covered this. But a lot of this was talking about infrastructure and tooling and credit systems and things like that. And those are all very, very important. But I'm wondering if any of these updates are going to be looking at content. Because I have been on Drupal since Drupal 5. And in that time, Drupal.org has gotten more and more and more unwieldy in terms of trying to actually find an answer to I'm yeah. trying to do a thing. And I know Dries mentioned this morning talking about updating documentation, but it's not just documentation, it's outdated module pages, it's you land on an issue and you think you've solved your problem, but it turns out it was for Drupal 6. You know, yeah. like what, what can we do to make the site more usable from a content perspective as well? That's a good question, and that's also a question of sort of scope and role. So, um, and I promise this answer is not a cop-out, this answer is a history, which is that Historically, we are providing the tools for the community to sort of self-organize, decide who's going to step in and be part of a documentation working group, who's going to step in and be part of all these other things, and use the tools on Drupal.org to build these things. But in more recent years, we've gotten more directly involved in certain kinds of things, like uh, the Project Browser and Auto Update stuff, which normally would not have been a DA-related initiative, except we're part of the project infrastructure. And so now, I don't have a, a, a like, affirmative answer, but there are conversations of should a sort of, you know, a documentation guru or a content strategist or something be a DA role that is specifically focused on archiving content that's no longer relevant or something like that. Like there's, there's some conversation about that, but I'll say there is a resource contention issue in terms of what roles we can kind of create. Um, so I don't know where that will shake out, but I do know there's a significant desire from multiple sources and I think there's several folks talking specifically about the documentation uh, question here at the con. There was a boff about it, that one specifically. I don't know the time, but, um, but yes, I hear you completely because 
I actually often say, which might be a weird thing for an engineering uh, team lead to say, but I often say that we are too quick to th throw a technological solution at something that is either a people or a content problem. And sometimes we will rebuild a system three times without solving the content that's living in that system, so. Hey, this is a contribution credit note. There's a lot of discussion, understandably, about folks trying to game the system and how sure. do we work around that. I also want to note, you know, I think there's an opportunity to reward more people for valuable contributions that aren't just code. And I know there's yes. been talk of this. Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe previously the credit system used to automatically pre-populate the checkboxes if you were submitting a patch mm -hmm. for maintainers to <coughs> apply that. It no longer does that. Correct. It, right. Um, which is great, but what I've seen sometimes is that there's still a sociological like instinct of like, well, patch, if you submit a patch and it's a, a good patch, like for sure you get credit. But then it's a little less clear for other contributions in an issue of like, it, it's a little more up to the maintainer and I'm a maintainer. That's exactly projects. the point you're making. So yeah. y what I'm really saying is I wanna encourage other maintainers to be generous for mm -hmm. the people that are providing um, value in their issue queues that aren't just code contributions. If this is my yep. personal opinion, but if someone is providing a well thought out comment, a change of direction, a suggestion, like I generously reward those contributions because they are valuable to me in my issue queues. Yep. So I just want to note that and say like, th that's the, the mirror side of the people trying Absolutely. to game the system. Yes. I also want to highlight the people that are doing good work, I want to reward them generously as well. I, I would absolutely amplify that, and you're right. By design, the system is organized around maintainers ultimately being the arbiters of their projects. There's a very valuable resource that the core maintainer team maintains. There's the their issue etiquette page and core maintainer credit policy, which talks a lot about similar sorts of things, the ways in which they try to be generous, what they do give credit for, what they don't get credit for, and it's actually, it's. Uh, even though our, we all, this happens all across Drupal and all across technology, even though we talk about the problems more often, um, there's actually like a majority of the work has gone into the like affirmative solutions. So it's a really good reminder um, that we should be, we should be focusing on good intent. Even when I'm talking about, you know, this, this possibility that we now have to apply negative credits if we have to, uh, for me, that is a last resort so that I can get technical leadership of an organization in a room to actually let me do a training day with their teams, right? Like these kinds of things. So we do want to make this a, a matter of mentorship and community building. But we are way past out of time. So thank you very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Oh, and next door, it's probably already started, is uh, the Dries-led Drupal Starshot boff for all the people who have pledged and want to find a place to contribute. It's right next door. Uh, in 204.